Right, I'll make that five past. So I think what we'll do, everyone, is uh, make a start. Um, if everyone wants to uh, mute themselves for now, that'd be really appreciated. Um, and hopefully you can all see uh, the title screen of, uh, of my presentation. So um, good morning, everyone, and, and thanks for joining us this morning for Parts Management in a Nutshell. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Tom Langridge. I'm Head of Training at Garage Hive. Um, I will presume that the majority of you guys probably didn't manage to catch me at the blend. Um, so this is a good opportunity for us to uh, rerun through that material. Uh, so um, again, thanks for taking the time and uh, let's, uh, let's make a start. So the agenda today. We're going to look at uh, the parts journey through the garage hive system. We're going to talk about GSF integration. A system clear up. You know, some of you might be here to maintain uh, your parts. Um, and some of you may be here because you've got a little bit of work to get back to a, a point where you're clear. So we're going to talk about system clear up. And then at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session. So good stock control, why? Um, there are lots and bells and whistles with, with Garage Hive. There's lots of features, but fundamentally, uh, we are managing job sheets uh, with labors and items. So the two areas of the system uh, that um, need maintenance from that are the maintenance of job sheets, making sure they're being posted, deleted, uh, moved moved on if they're work in progress, uh, but also the the flow and movement of items through the system. So we've got job sheets and we've got items. Uh, I think the the benefits of good stock control. I think uh, for one, for me, it's a, it's a feeling of control, um, knowing that you're not letting money go out the back door. Um, we all know that it's certainly to our advantage as garages to uh, maintain and track uh, our items and make sure they're either being invoiced, uh, written off or returned. So um, what we're going to do today is, is look at a few different examples of parts and their different journeys through the Garage Hive system. So the first part we've got today is Alex, the anti-roll bar link. So Alex uh, likes keeping things stable and dislikes pineapple on pizza. Let's take a look at uh, Alex's garage hive journey. So first of all, let's talk about parts and how we know if a part is ordered, if it's here, if it's not here. Here we have an example of an item that has been not ordered yet it is the item is has been produced on the job sheet. We can see it's a miscellaneous item. We have a check flag and if we were to open that check flag, uh, we would see that the item quantity was unavailable because there is no uh, inventory level of misc. And we can see there is no purchase order raised against that item. And that would suggest to us this item has not been ordered. Here's an example of an item that has been ordered. So we've still got the MISC, we've got our check, um, but we can see the vendor set to GSF, the purchase special ticked, and the purchase order number that's been raised against that line. And if everybody in the garage sticks to the fact of always raising a PO at the point of ordering a part, then everyone should be able to confident that if they see appear raised, the item is still missed, and we still have the check that this item has been ordered, but it has not yet arrived. And finally, we have an item here that's now got a part number. Our check is gone. And as you can see, we can still see the PO at the end. This is an item that's been booked in. The purchase order has been posted. And this item is here. 
And like I said earlier, just with that simple rule of everyone sticking to always raising, raising purchase orders at the point of order, uh, we'll make it really clear. A anyone can then check a job sheet and should be able to be confident what the status of that part is. So Alex, the anti roll bar link is a is a job that we've got booked in. It's been booked in as uh, that job, so we know what we need to order prior to the vehicle being dropped off. There's a couple of ways of going through um, your your potential next day's jobs. It might be that you look further ahead than that, but we'll call it next day's jobs in this example. Um, we you could go to the schedule and you could look at each job individually looking like we said on the previous slides as to whether an item is missed uh, without the PO or so on and so forth. Um, I, the risk I've always found with that is you may uh, not click into every job. Have you clicked into this one? Have you clicked into that one? So I've always found it's more efficient to produce a list um, of the bookings for that day. And you can do that through your total job sheets tile uh, by filtering by booking date. Um, you can do this every day by simply putting tomorrow's date in on the filter. But as you can see on this slide, you can put a formula in as well of plus one D. And this will always show you the next day's bookings. Um, I often set up a separate one as well. So you've got one that you use Monday to Thursday. Um, I'm presuming in this case that you're at the garage isn't open on a Saturday, by the way. Uh, and then on a Friday, uh, you can use a, a, another um, saved filter that will be plus three days, which would take you to Monday. So um, just having those two filters means that you can quickly uh, and easily get a list of bookings for a day. Uh, and as I'm talking through any of this, um, if on the back of this you have any questions of how to set this up, then please do contact us on support. So once I have a list of job bookings for that day, I will open the first booking. And what you'll notice when you open your filtered list is you have a right arrow. And this allows you to flick through that list you've just produced. And by being able to go to the next job and the next job and the next job until there simply is no more right arrow, you can be confident that you have looked at all the bookings for that day. And provided any car that is carried over, that has been in for inspection, maybe you have picked up the inspection and ordered the parts for that as you go along, this method will pick up all fresh bookings. And again, we can go through, have we got an order number against that job yet? No, we haven't, right, okay, then possibly I would have thought we'd need to get that ordered. I will tick the purchase special button and input the vendor that I'm most probably going to get that from. And again, in this example, when I'm going to presume we're calling this order in. I don't actually raise the order number until I'm on the phone to the supplier. Um, I would tick the purchase special, put the vendor I'm most likely to get that from and go to the next job until I'm at the end of my list and then go back to the first job. And then whilst on the phone to uh, the supplier, you are two clicks away by pressing parts on the top of the job sheet and then create purchase order from raising your purchase order. And this ensures that we're only going to have a purchase order if the item has definitely been ordered. Once the item arrives, we're going to go to our purchasing and purchase order section and get my list of purchase orders, which is essentially a list of things you're waiting to arrive. From within the uh, purchase order. We're going to fill in such details as the item number and uh, invoice number and ultimately once we match to the penny, we're going to receive an invoice that purchase order provided we've had the invoice. Um, if anyone's ever maybe not stopped for a second when they hit OK on the screen, we can see there whether we have the three options. Um, in most cases, you're going to receive uh, a part or an item with uh, an actual invoice. But there is a possibility that you may receive a part with a delivery note 
uh, with an invoice to follow. And Garage Hive with a tracked item, which most of the items on your system will be, will only sell a tracked item if it knows it has the inventory to do so. Therefore, we would potentially need to receive an item before we have a full invoice. And having the ability to do so uh, allows you to sell out that item before necessarily completing the purchase order with the order number. And that can be later invoiced once you do have that order number. Now, once the purchase order has been processed, ultimately that item will sit on a job. That job will go through the workshop, it'll get worked on. Uh, and as long as that part has been required, ultimately it will be invoiced out on the job sheet. Uh, if we've ordered one of those items, that would take the item inventory down to zero once invoiced, and that would complete that item's journey through the Garage Hive system. So next we've got Dawn the Diff. Dawn the Diff likes traction and wine and dislikes burnouts. So let's take a look at Dawn's Garage Hive journey. So the processing onto the system in this case is exactly the same as Alex. This is something that you can either individually go straight to a job sheet and raise a purchase order, or you may, if ordering for a days or a period's worth of uh, jobs, do it from a list that is filtered. But once booked in, unfortunately, Dawn gets dropped and gets broken. So we remove the item from the job. Um, now, a quick note here. Um, I know we're not going to return this item, but as soon as an item that has been special ordered in for a job sheet is removed from a job sheet, deleted, it will automatically drop into the items to return report provided this item hasn't been marked as warehouse stock, as maximum inventory warehouse stock that you want to carry, such as your oils, your bulbs, things like that. Hopefully you all have in your system at any one time, an internal job sheet. There are, there are always gonna be items uh, in a garage that we need to buy that we don't invoice out individually as that item to the customer. They could be covered by a consumables charge, so it could be stuff like blue roll or brake cleaner. But anything that is a needs to be written off at cost to the business, that is an item with an inventory level in your system, you can process uh, the cost of that item through an internal job sheet. If any of you um, don't have an internal job sheet or you may even have a number of internal job sheets it may be worth looking into them um, posting that allows you to account for the cost of those items against your gross profits it also means your inventory level just doesn't keep going up uh, you don't want to get to that point in the year and have a stock value level which is inaccurate and far too high because you haven't been writing off your consumables so that's what we in this case do with Dawn. Dawn has been broken at our fault, therefore is a cost to the garage, therefore it needs to go onto the internal job sheet. Now on that internal job sheet the cost is going to show, but we're not going to sell it to ourselves, so you'd either remove the unit price or 100% discount that item down. Ultimately at the end of a period you may run a internal job sheet for a day. You could run it for a week, you could run it for a month. Ultimately, when that's posted, you will need to raise a new internal job sheet, so there's always one running at any one time. The more regularly you post your internal job sheet, the less, uh, the more incremental the, the effect will be on your uh, gross profits. If you write off all your costs in terms of uh, your consumables at the end of the month, that will obviously knock off at that point. Whereas if you were to do this weekly, so it's just a worth being aware on that in terms of keep an eye on that gross profit number. So the next item, we have Lee the silencer. Now Lee 
likes letting out fumes and telling people how to cancel and correct documents. He dislikes retail parks on a Sunday evening. Let's take a look at Lee's garage hive journey. So our garage, our example garage we're using today, um, I'm going to say is uh, does a lot of exhaust, does a lot of exhaust and tires. So there are some items uh, that are worth this garage keeping in stock. Uh, I'm sure you all have some stock, whether it be just a barrel of oil and some other fluids and a few bulbs and you special order in everything else, right through to some of you who may specialize uh, and have quite a large uh, holding of stock. Um, and it'd be nice uh, if we can have a method of maintaining those stock levels. And we do, we have the requisition worksheet express. The way to think of this essentially is as a reorder, a reorder report, a reorder worksheet. Um, the first thing to do if you want to set um, ideal stock levels on your items is go to your items list and then any item that you want to keep um, a minimum amount of. First of all, the reorder policy of maximum quantity is how we tell the system this is a warehouse item that we don't want to show on our items to return list. Remember, um, anything that isn't on a job sheet, I said earlier, drops onto your items to return list. But what we wouldn't want on our items to return list are our oils, um, things that may not necessarily be on a job sheet. They are there ready to use, ready to apply to an invoice for a customer. Um, and by setting the reorder policy to maximum in the item card, we're effectively telling the system this is a warehouse or stock item. And at that point, we can put a reorder point in, in this case of 10. The items to return, uh, sorry, the, uh, the requisition worksheet express was a, um, a process, something that you would run manually. Um, but after a lot of feedback, we've now automated this process. So you can have a tile for items to order and you can set the worksheet to, to run overnight effectively so that when you get there the next day, you have a, a list of things you should order to maintain your stock levels. But whether it's ran, manually or whether it's automated um, effectively, it will get you to the same point in the end. So in this case, um, Lee the silencer, um, the reorder point is 10, as you can see on the right. Um, we have an inventory level of five and there is one on a job sheet. So to maintain our stock level of 10 and fulfill our future booking, which is our job sheet of one, we would need to order a quantity of six, as you can see from the lines. So this, this report is taken into account, those future bookings. Um, and if you'd already got some on a purchase order, it wouldn't tell you to order the same amount, it would minus that amount as well. Ultimately, you will then have 10 in stock once you have serviced both the, the jobs that are booked in and or any purchase orders that are already um, already raised. Not only does the requisition worksheet express tell us what we should order, it's also um, helps us process those items onto a purchase order. You have the option to process lines. And when you hit OK, you'll get two options. One, um, to create a new um, uh, purchase order. Um, uh, and, and by doing so through this, rather than manually, um, it just saves you that bit of time, especially if you've got a long list of 10 items for one supplier and five items for another. What this would do is create two purchase orders, one with the five items in for one vendor and the 10 for the other. Once raised, um, that purchase order will be booked in in the same way as you book in any other purchase order. It will be a purchase order on your purchase order list, um, this would be, in this case, a standalone purchase order, not linked to a job, because this is uh, for a stock item. But once there's a few different place, ways you can raise a purchase order, 
but ultimately once raised the booking in process is exactly the same. As we can see here, once we've booked some in, in this case, we've got four in stock at the moment and we've got two on a job sheet. And from that job sheet, we simply put in item and search our stock file, our inventory for that item. Now you search in the number box, but it will search the description or the item number. And at that point, you apply that item to the job sheet. And then ultimately, the item will be invoiced out when that job is posted, completing Lee's journey through the Garage Hive system. So I want to take a minute to talk about stock taking whilst we're talking about warehouse and stock items. Physical inventory journal. So um, some of you may have used this, some of you may not. Uh, more of you I would have thought would be more familiar with an item journal. Uh, and that item journal is how we adjust stock levels. Um, and the physical inventory journal is, is quite similar in the way that this will allow you to journal and uh, uh, and change those stock levels now it's it's worth noting that doing an item journal or a physical inventory journal doesn't fix the reason why that item might have an incorrect stock level if you have a purchase invoice you have not posted and they sat there and not gone through the system by doing a stock take or any sort of journal you might correct the stock level but you won't fix the fact that that purchase invoice hasn't been applied. So it's just worth noting that the, that uh, when we're talking about the any sort of journal. Now on physical inventory journal, you can calculate inventory. You need to give this uh, stock take a document number. It could be today's date with ST for stock take. It could be whatever you like. That's your reference uh, to uh, this this count. And then there's all sorts of ways you can filter. You can filter by item category. Um, you can filter by uh, bin, as we can see here. But ultimately, if you wanted to do a full count, you wouldn't put any filters on and you would hit OK. What this will do is calculate uh, your current inventory. As we can see here, we have a calculated quantity in the example of this oil filter of 230. And just to the right, we have a column that says physical inventory. And this is where we apply how many we actually have. If I was to put 225 in there, then the entry type on the left would go to negative. And just to the right, we'd have a column that says quantity of five, because when we hit post, what that would do to correct that inventory level would be to do a negative adjustment of five. So with this, you just go through and put your physical actual inventory levels. You can add items on if there's items that aren't on the list at all and create those items from the screen as well. Then eventually you'll be at the point where you can post and that will make those changes to that stock file, to those inventory levels. And what I've found in the past quite, uh, it depends how much you stock. If you're a garage who has a lot uh, of stock with different uh, shelf numbers, then I would potentially uh, do what I would call a target account through the year where you count something as, an, as a section through the year. And then at least once a year, you do that full stock take, meaning that everything gets counted at least twice a year. And again, this all depends, I suppose, on the uh, the speed of the flow of items through your business. And it was, it'll, be, it'll be different to every garage. Uh, but I would certainly want to count everything at least twice a year. And you can do so through targeted counts on a monthly basis on departments and then an overall stock take at the end of the year. If whilst doing that stock take, we have an issue and we're wondering why an item is showing in stock, maybe we don't have it, then we can link to the item uh, and look at the item history. And this will show you the movement of this item from the get go. Uh, and in this case, you can see uh, that this item we're looking at as an example here has been positively adjusted as an opening balance. And then 
has gone back down to zero with a purchase return order. So in this case, the inventory would be zero. But looking at that movement can sometimes highlight why, at what point the error was made that allowed this item to still show in stock. Now, ultimately, if you don't have that item, it will need either writing off or if you have sent it away, you can hopefully get a credit. And I'm sure there'll be some items that you look at the cost and think, well, for the sake of that, I'm just going to write it off. But there will, of course, I'm sure, be items that you want to check uh, and understand why those items have an incorrect inventory level. And, and your items history is uh, a really good tool to help you do so. So the next part we've got is Elliot, the exhaust bracket. Elliot likes the gym and he dislikes carbs. Let's take a look at Elliot's garage hive journey. Again, this is an item for a specific job sheet. So the purchase order will have been raised as an item line in a customer's job sheet. However, this item is an item we do no longer need. The job has been done. The job comes back as an allocation complete to us. That, as we know, that allocation complete is our front of house prompt to check where that job is at. And in this case, we have an item that has not been ticked. And if we're lucky, we might even have a tech comment saying that the part wasn't required. What I'm going to do at that point is press the three dots on that line and delete the item from the job sheet. As we covered earlier, once deleted, an item will show in the items to return report. And this um, from a, how it works is, is remarkably similar to the requisition worksheet express we were looking at earlier for our stock items. In that it's a report, yes, that tells you what items since the last time you have done this have been deleted from job sheets and therefore are likely to need returning. But it is also a tool that will help us produce those return orders to save us having to manually write them out. The quantity available for return is how many the system thinks we should have. And the quantity for return is how many we physically find. Now at this point, um, I think it's just worth pointing out and some of this is, you know, real fundamentals, but I think a lot, a lot of this is with, with, I, you know, stock management is, you know, talking really about those fundamentals and those processes. Um, I would always have um, one place that the guys uh, and girls in the workshop put their items that they haven't used. I quite like a two-stage system where you have a uh, a bin or a shelf where everyone puts their unused items. And then when we get to the point on front of house of uh, looking at our items to return list and processing our returns, uh, once processed, um, I would put those items in a second area where suppliers know they can take those returns from. And that just gives you that little bit of control that nothing's gonna go before you're aware of what it is. If I have one to return, I fill in the quantity ret uh, to return and you can see that it will know provided you've bought the item in through a purchase order or invoice um, who the last vendor was. Now it's just worth noting that it might not necessarily be the one you're returning um, might not necessarily be from that vendor because you could buy the same part from two different vendors and it could be the one from a previous uh, vendor that you're you're sending back. So although it's useful to see uh, the last vendor, I, I wouldn't take it as absolute gospel. Again, if you need to, you can always go into the item and check the history to determine uh, which one it is you're sending back. We get two options at the point of processing onto return orders once we've highlighted how many of which item we've found. And in this case, uh, we're getting two options because there is already a um, a, a return order raised for this item. The way I see this is if I've got a shipment of items to send back, 
that I processed yesterday from my items to return list and they had not yet been picked up by the supplier, I'd be likely to put them on the existing return order and I'd select the alternative action of add to existing return order because I'd like to keep a shipment of returns as together in one place. Um, but if those items have already been picked up and I've shipped them, then I would put these on a new um, return return order. And if there wasn't an open return order for this vendor, we would only get the option to create new return order. Once raised, the return orders sit in our purchasing section in the same place you go to book in your purchase orders. It stands to reason really if we buy something in with a purchase order that we send it back with the purchase return order. And that was uh, one of the really uh, easy ways that I used when I was first using Garage Hive to remind myself what function we use to process uh, the returns because we process so many purchase orders on a daily basis. That's um, it's an easy one to remember. Now you'll notice that once raised the we have got a quantity of one. We are sending back a quantity of one of Elliot. We still have a quantity of one to ship. It is still here. And we still have a quantity of one to invoice. We have not have not yet had the credit. Now once an item um, is picked up. Once we notice a, a shipment has been taken. Then we would go to posting post and ship. And this number one here would move over to return quantity shipped. Now this isn't something that absolutely has to be done, but I think it keeps things nice and, and tidy. Um, by shipping an item, it removes it from your inventory, which is correct. The item has left your business. You haven't yet received your credit for it, but you don't currently hold that stock. So as soon as you ship an item, if you were to look at the inventory level, you would notice it has gone down by the amount you'd shipped. So it would be zero if you only had one in stock and you had just shipped it. Also, when you post and ship in the general section at the top of the return order, you can um, make note if you get it of the slip number from the supplier. This meaning if we look at our purchase return order list a few weeks later and we look at it and we think hmm, that date's a little bit old. I surely should have had my credit for that. By now um, we would open this purchase uh, return order. We would clearly see the item has been shipped and with any luck we'd also have a slip number putting us in a really strong position to speak to our supplier and obtain our credit. So we have the ship. Notice it's gone to shipped. And ultimately when we get the credit, we will go back to our return order. We will enter much like we do on a purchase order, the credit note number. Make sure the dates match up, make sure we've been credited for the right item numbers and the right values. Now there are uh, once once posted by the way that completes this item's journey through the garage hive system. Now there are a few scenario scenarios should I say with um, with credits. Um, it would be nice if uh, every time we sent uh, three items let's say on a return order we get one credit with three items on it. Uh, but what we might get is three credits. Or what we might get is we might have sent two separate orders over two days and they might send it as on one credit. So there we've got two return orders and one credit. Um, all of these sorts of scenarios can be handled. And although I'm not going to cover them in detail today, please please understand that they uh, all these scenarios can be handled. And uh, if you need to know how, then we have documentation and or, or alternatively please do call support as and when this happens for for a bit of help. Let's look at Adam, the Allen key. Adam likes keeping things tight. 
but he dislikes Reese. I thought that was a bit harsh, but he, he told me to keep it in. Let's take a look at Adam's garage hive journey. So this is quite a quick one. Um, and you can, there are ways um, physically of putting this sort of thing through garage hive, but tools generally um, will go straight to your accountancy system. Uh, you allow for those costs within your gross profit calculator. Um, therefore, those items don't need to go through garage hive. Um, so if uh, an invoice has been processed, in this case, if I'm going to use that method, I would just cancel that invoice because we never meant to put it through garage hive in the first place. Now, that being said, like I said, there, there are some people who may use that differently. If you have internal accountancy, then this part will certainly be different for you. Uh, but as a rule, if using external accountancy, stuff like tools, uh, along with your rates, bills and so forth, will go straight to your accountancy system. So not for garage hive. Next, we have Tom, a tube of cutting paste. Now, Tom likes causing friction, the sausage sandwiches, where anyone's got that one from. And dislikes salad, also a lie. Let's take a look at Tom's garage hive journey. So Tom is a classic example of a consumable, an item that we need to purchase, but ultimately we're not going to charge somebody 0 0.0001 a milliliter of cutting paste. Uh, we're going to write this off as a consumable. And if need be, we would probably cover uh, the, to the customer this through a uh, consumable item, non tract with a particular value. But it's not directly going to be the cutting paste part number. Therefore, this is an example, a really good example of when asked, you would go to your internal job sheet which by the way will always sit in current jobs as a job sheet without a booking date it will always sit in your current job sheet tile and you would simply go to that internal job sheet treating it just like a customer job sheet ordering in and holding this item on that internal job sheet until ultimately at the end of a period you post that job sheet at zero which accounts for the cost of that item and completes that item's journey in terms of the eventual level through the garage hive system. So Reese, the rear brake pads. Reese likes stylish waistcoats, but dislikes city traffic. So let's take a look at Reese's Alley Cat and GH journey. Now, some of you may be already using GSF. Um, fantastic step forward in terms of that integration. Um, really good time saving tool. Um, and I'm sure that if any of you uh, want feedback from anybody using it, they'd be happy to do so. And again, in terms of the setup, there is documentation and you can call support. Now, fundamentally, you will build your estimate or job um, in exactly the same way that you have. You might do it manually by putting labor and item lines on. You may use a service package, service schedules, repair times, whatever it is you normally use. But ultimately, you will have some item lines on a job sheet um, that if you went to parts from the action bar and open Alicat online. This redirects you to the account for the Alicat online catalog and opens the page, especially if you've used repair times in the appropriate section with the vehicle registration number. From here, you can select the right item and add this to your basket. From within the basket, we have the option to send quote to garage hive.
And then from within the job sheet you're working on in the action bar, again, we have parts and then get alley cat baskets. This will pull down such information uh, as the vendor item number, the price, but we'll leave the actual item number as MISC because one of the advantages of leaving an item as MISC until it arrives is it's a nice, quick, easy way of everyone knowing that item is unlikely to have arrived or at least it hasn't been booked in. So we want to keep with that theme of keeping MISC until the item is booked in. When the item arrives from the purchase order, also gone are the days where you have to manually type in part numbers and prices because we can pull that down through um, the purchase order. So a real time saver. Um, not only that, but from the job sheet, when you raise a purchase order um, with GSF, you'll get the option uh, of would like would you like to raise this Alicat order with your GSF branch now? So it's not just a lookup, it's also linked with your local branch and we'll order that. And then here, as you can see, on the purchase order, we can convert placeholder items, saving us the time of entering part numbers and prices in the purchase order. So all in all, a massive step forward. I know a lot of people have been waiting a long time um, for catalogues. Um, we're, we've had a lot of really good feedback, um, obviously a work in progress, uh, but I think uh, a really good tool uh, to add to the Garage Hive armory. Again, if you need to learn more documentation online, please do give us a call. Once booked in, this item has the same journey as any other item. It'll either be invoiced on a job sheet, deleted, returned, or written off at a cost. So some of you may have a specific parts manager. If you do, uh, there are functions on Garage Hive to help with the communication between the two departments. The parts manager can obviously utilize the preset filters for tomorrow's bookings to order parts. Being able to look whether there are MISC items. And this does rely on the person building the job and booking in the job, either using a service package or putting the correct MISC item lines on. And I think that's important in terms of getting, ultimately you're gonna have to build that job sheet anyway. So why not have it as often as possible set through a service package or repair times. Or if you're doing the item lines manually, make sure you pop them on there rather than just a comment. That means when whoever it is, whether it's a parts manager or whether it's yourself who's checking tomorrow's bookings for parts, you can confidently just look for that MISC item without the PO to know you need to still order that item. Now, once a vehicle's in, it'll have a vehicle inspection. I want to imagine this car has got a, a knocking noise at the front of the vehicle, and it's come in and had an inspection, a checklist completed by a technician. That checklist has been picked up and read by front of house and has been converted into a vehicle inspection estimate. Now, this may be at the point um, of just raising that estimate, you may rely on your parts manager to populate the lines on the estimate, the item lines, the labor lines. It may be them who's got that sort of knowledge to be best place to do that. Or it may be that your front of house are confident enough to build those item and labor lines themselves, either manually or through packages or repair times, and then set that estimate to awaiting parts. Either way, this communicates to the parts manager that it's their, it's their turn. It's for them to pick up and to apply either parts prices and or the lines, depending, like I say, whose role you decide that is. Once the parts manager's done their bit and they've entered whatever information they've been asked for, most likely prices, 
and that estimate is ready to sell, ready for the customer to be contacted or preferably used with online auth. That estimate can be set back to a waiting advisor, therefore notifying front of house that the parts manager has done their bit and that this is ready to pick up and contact the customer. Once the front of house advisor has got authorization, copied those items over to the job sheet, scheduled the additional work, they will raise a purchase, um, requires uh, parts ordering in this case. If you didn't have a parts manager, you'd go ahead and order that and you'd raise the purchase order, either using Alicat or manually over the phone. But there is a slider within that job sheet of requires parts ordering. And this is where you're telling your parts manager that we need to order that part here and now. Not for a future booking, because we're going to pick those up by looking for MISC items through our filtered total job sheets list. This is where it's been in for an inspection and we've determined it needs an item that needs ordering there and then. Once ordered, that can be removed. And you would simply see when checking jobs for the next day that that part was already on its way. So in conclusion, I suppose every item has a journey and every journey needs to have a destination. And it's always that bit easier if we know what directions we need to take during that journey to get to that destination. As I said earlier, there is a number of ways in which a, a purchase can be raised. It could be for a stock item, a standalone purchase order, just by going to purchasing purchase orders and new. As we've discussed, we could be filtering to a particular date or dates and ordering for future bookings. We could be ordering an item for a single job sheet on the back of an inspection. Or we could be ordering a workshop consumable. Whichever way, we raise a purchase order once raised it will stay as a purchase order in our purchase orders list and the booking in process is exactly the same once on the system it ultimately needs to exit the system and it can do so either on a customer's job sheet ideally on an internal job sheet if that needs to be written off at cost or if the item is unused, a return and a credit processed. If each and every item has one of those three outcomes, you will have a clear items to return report. If I'm going to anyone's garage for a refresher, there's two areas I instantly look at. One is the current job sheets tile. If the current job sheets tile the numeric number in there is much higher than what they might have booked in for that day. A few cars for work in progress carry over, plus their internal job sheet. So if we're doing 10 jobs in a day and we've got five cars carrying over and our internal job sheet, we should have roughly 16 jobs in current jobs. So if I look at someone's system and they've got 50 or 60 jobs in there, that indicates to me that somewhere there is an issue with process in terms of either processing or deleting as required job sheets. But the other section and probably more relevant to what I'm talking about today is the all important items to return list. I cannot stress enough that if you maintain that on a regular basis and look at your items to return list and process those items, you shouldn't be in a position um, other than from your stock take of your warehouse items be losing too much money out the back door. And what does good look like? Well, a healthy stock value, you should see it go up as you buy something, drop that down as you sell something. And, and, and you know, unless you have increased what is the stock lines you are carrying, you should see that pretty much stay reasonably consistent. Um, and if you see a hike in stock value, you, you should be aware of what it is you've bought but 
essentially, unless you've in increased the amount of lines you're keeping, you should see that go up and down, yes, but stay relatively stable. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the reporting side. I know um, that Alex's webinar um, probably covered this in, in some more detail. So Tom's top tips for garage hive stock control. Have a designated area where parts are dropped off, ideally with the invoice always coming in to reception or to the parts manager if you have one. We need to be aware when parts arrive so that in a timely manner we can post that purchase order because ultimately that customer's job will not invoice until that part is booked in. I think you can get away with just three trays in the office these days. One for invoices and credits in, not yet processed. Another tray for once you've processed that purchase order or purchase return order, physically marked it, and put it in a tray to check off at the end of the day, and maybe a tray for your MOT tickets or refusals. Say it, but I'll say it again. Check your items to return report on a regular basis. And do an end of day, at least once every 24 hours, including checking off purchases. Our end of day reports um, in hand with our customer till payments report will allow you to make sure that everything that you have purchased that day or been credited for has been put through Garage Hive accurately to the physical invoices you have. And it will also allow you to check that the sales you have put through, both uh, by any tender, whether it be cash, card, have been put through accurately, and that also matches up. <clears throat> if something's wrong, it can be corrected. And correcting that on the day or the next morning, with the help of support if needed, obviously, means you shouldn't at the end of the month, get a bookkeeper coming to you asking you why this was a penny out on the VAT a month ago or whether this uh, job that you posted should have been cash rather than card a month ago. So that end of day procedure, I think not generally, not just on items, but um, will certainly um, keep everything nice and straight. And complete an annual stock take and potentially monthly targeted counts on different categories if you hold a larger amount of stock. So what if you're sat here thinking, well, that's all well and good, but I'm in a position at the minute with the best will in the world where my items to return list is not empty and my stock file might not be entirely accurate for whatever reason. So where do we go? First of all, I'd look at my current job sheets tile. Because ultimately, I don't want to start looking through my items to return list to then delete a load more jobs that I realised I didn't need for lots more items to then drop on to my items to return list when I've already cleared it. So before getting my items in order, I'd make sure my job sheets were in order. Make sure you've processed or deleted as required any purchase or purchase return orders and credit memos. And then you want to go to your items to return report. Now in this situation, there are a few different options with items on the items to return report. You may have some consumables that have crept onto there because they haven't been written off in an internal job sheet. And in that case, you would need to put those items onto an internal job sheet. Um, or arguably you could leave until you do your stock take at the end, it will write it off in the same way. But just to keep things in a nice logical order, um, writing off those items uh, within an internal job sheet that have crept in, you might find some blue roll, you might find some brake cleaner, that sort of thing, seat covers, gloves. There may also be items on that list which are your stock items. It might say a barrel of C3 oil, you know, 205 litres of C3. Now, it's correct that you 
have that inventory level, or you would presume that you'll find that out later on your stock take. Um, but you don't want it to show on your items to return list. You want that to be not on a job sheet and available to select for, for a job sheet from your from your warehouse stock. So in those cases, you can mark the items with the maximum inventory reorder policy, which will remove them from your items to return list, although the stock is still there to use. And then ultimately you'll be left with a list of stuff which you're unsure of why it's there. Things that have been bought in specifically for vehicles more than likely. And that's where you can make a decision really on what you investigate, looking into why it is the stock level it is, what you can get credits for and processing as many credits as possible. Then ultimately you'll be left with an amount to write off. And this may have quite a, a, a effect on your gross profit, but don't be disheartened uh, because your gross profit always was what it ultimately says once you've got your stock straight. You've just realigned your system to be telling you the truth. So even if you do take a bit of a hit, just be reassured that you're now looking at accurate numbers, even if those numbers may be slightly lower once you've written off a few items that have slipped the net. Then finally, use a physical inventory journal to complete a full stock take. Ultimately, this will put you straight and uh, then you can maintain your items to return list far easily uh, every couple of days, probably every day if you're a busy garage, but it all depends on the flow of how many items and who you've got to do that. So I think what I'll do now is um, probably open up to questions. So you're all welcome to uh, uh, unmute uh, uh, and ask questions and um, go from there. No questions so far. Is is any is anybody in that? Uh, oh, go on. Go oh, on sorry, going. Tom. I had a question. I had myself muted there. Hi, mate. Um, just Alika um, to mention, um, we are unable to order via the process. Is that? I know, I know down south it's GSF, but it's Dingbro up here. Is, is that Dingbro? Is that a Dingbro issue there? But behind, or uh, if I'm honest, that's something I need to check with you. But I've just made a note. Um, and I'll certainly get the answer for you and call you back later today. Yeah, if, if you also don't the, that. you know how you, when you, when you go through the order, it, you use the, the brake pads and it gives you a, an illustration of the brake pads and stuff like that, with none of that kind of stuff with our okay. alley cat either. So it may be that uh, there are differences up in the north, but let's, um, let's get together if you don't mind um, mm -hmm. after today's session, because uh, it'd be interesting for me to know that I'm actually no um, c coming up to Scotland actually, mm -hmm. uh, next week it'd be interesting to see how that works so right if you, if, if you don't mind we'll pick up on that one uh yeah um, personally after this uh after the session okay perfect thanks mate okay um i had one on the item card you know yes. you've got maximum quantity and you've got your uh reorder point yes what is, what is the um Oh, what's the next one down? It's something like maximum inventory or something like that. I can't think what it's. So we've got the item card. Yeah, so so maximum inventory is as much as though what it sounds. It's, you know, you, you want to keep a maximum of uh, this many. Now, whether that physically stops you ordering it or whether it's just a visual, um, I would need to double check. But essentially, that is you marking in that item. It may be that you keep it in a particular place and you can only store 10 of them. So you want to make it clear to everyone that you would not want to keep a over yeah. 10 of those. Any more than that. Yes. Okay. So is there anywhere, for example, we get, um, do, we're quite different because we've got a lot of the same vehicle that we do. Yes, uh, I remember, yeah, yeah. We're, we're quite different in that way. So for example, we can order um, sort of like 20 filters for our Renault Masters and, um, get a better price. So it's 
Richard obviously knows that he can do that, but is there anywhere on the item card where we say, you know, a, an order quantity type thing that is a general, rather than just order one of these at a time, there's certain items that I would say, you know. I, th I think a, a good way, to, uh, an example to, and correct me if I'm wrong, please do, but um, I think that sometimes there is a certain amount of, of knowledge. For example, it may say that I need to order 50 litres of some oil. Yeah. Um, but I know those uh, those just through experience that that is far better bought in a barrel at 205 litres. Yeah. So at the point of being on my requisition worksheet express and it's saying, right, you need to order 50 of these um, yeah. before I hit process return orders, just through that knowledge of those items and how they're ordered, uh, I, I, I would I would put that to 205 at that point before hitting process. You just continue to ask me. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Now, if I think of a better way than that, I will let you know. But no, yeah. I think that is that is experience on understanding the parts you're you're ordering, uh, yeah. and 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 changing it because the system really can only look at well, you've got this many in stock, you've said this many, let's do the mass order this many. Um, I don't think, as far as I know, there is uh, currently a way of saying these normally come in a batch of, and it automatically changing that. Okay. Um, but right. uh, potentially a good idea for the future. How possible it is, I'm not sure. But actually, it's uh, not a bad call that. Yeah, okay, thanks. Hello, Tom. Hiya. Can, when I go through my items to return list, I'm going to come across probably a lot of tools that I need to get rid of. Yep. Uh, can I just delete them? How, do, how would you delete them best? Well, we, well can, can you just delete them? Yeah, I mean, you could, you could just journal them, couldn't you? Um, journaling them out with an item journal with the physical inventory journal at the end or posting on an internal job sheet would uh, ultimately you have put the cost of those items on your uh, garage hive by buying them yeah um, so writing that off at this point wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing but if you've accounted for that value I don't know if you use your gross profit calculator but you don't want to account for something twice. So if something's through, gone through Garage Hive, you don't necessarily want to be counting for that cost on your GP calculator as well. So, um, so yes, physically you can. Of course, you could you could do when you do your physical inventory journal at the end. Just by not counting those and posting them, it will get rid of that stock, um, um, and that will get, show against your gross profit on your on your. Um, How do your I Power BI without affecting my gross profit? Because I know it's already gone through and I've already paid for it because it'll be on my P and L. But yeah, again, if if it was if 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 in it depends on the scenario, but if in this month you could you should certainly quite easily cancel that. Um and uh and then put it direct to your accounting system. Now if if you're not in the current month and you've already exported, then that sort of raises a few more questions. Yeah. Um but ultimately um ultimately I wouldn't be too worried about it pulling down any, anything you write off, like I said earlier, anything you write off, whether it be a tool or whether it be an item that's crept on, ultimately your gross profit already was yeah. what it ultimately says. It's just you didn't know. Yeah. Um, so I would be brutally honest with it because it's only, you know, it's only really yourself those numbers are for as the business owner. Yeah. Um, so be brutally honest with it, get it all written off. And the fact that your GP will show lower, I wouldn't see it as a negative thing, see it as a positive thing that it is uh, then more accurate than it was before and hopefully it doesn't make any uh, 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 big issues for any wider plans you've made with the business. Yeah okay. So yeah I, I can see oh sorry <laughs> just finish. <laughs> Is that everything Dave? Yeah. Nice. Is that everything yeah okay then we have some people raised hands and it's Amy you can go first. Um, you probably need to unmute yourself. Okay, if Amy doesn't start talking, then Gavin and Eleanor, you can probably go next. And then Emma. <laughs> yeah, Hello. I was following oh. on what somebody oh, else just said in regards to those tools. We've had it here where I have bought tools into stock that I have bought for the particular branch that I work at. Now, we did end up having to cancel the invoices and get them processed through head office, like Tom said. But alternatively, if you if you are outside of that month, you could create a job sheet for internal tools and just keep them sat there. 
So they are in your stock, they are accounted for, but you, you know, you're not like it's not that you need to book that tool out because you're always going to have it. So if you don't want to book it out and you're outside the month you actually purchased it on, you may also be able to just leave it on an internal job sheet just for company tools as such that you know you're going to buy in that aren't going to get booked out. That will then take it off your items to return. Um, but my second point was, I just wanted an opinion, other people's opinion on what you do with damaged parts. So if you had a job come in and it was an ABS sensor and the technician damaged the wheel bearing, but you haven't quoted for that. So would you book a wheel bearing out on the job so you get the actual profit of that job on that day? Say you may lose money on it because you've damaged the part. Or would you create a separate internal job sheet for damaged parts that you write off at the end of the month? I was just interested in what other people's thoughts were into that. Would you write off the damaged parts that day or wait till the end of the month? I think that's a really good question, actually, Emma, because I suppose the, the key question you're asking is, is, is are you, are you um, in processing it through the job sheet, you're going to show the actual, um, the actual profit on that job, including that part having been written off down to nothing. Yeah. Um, and and keep it on that job. So so has anybody uh, has anybody else had any thoughts on this and uh, and have an answer there for Emma on, on how you process it? Yeah, I think we we, we put ours on if that happens, uh, put it on the internal uh, job sheet and then post at the end of the month. So it's not actually on that that job. I think it depends how you're looking at your figures, isn't it? You're looking at it from a, I might want to look at how much as a report I'm. I'm putting out as a service type of internal. So so from that point of view, putting it on the internal job sheet is, is probably better for you. If you're more likely to be looking at it from a job sheet analysis point of view, then you're probably better off doing it the way uh, through the job sheets. Yeah. Um, it would probably yeah. be my thoughts anyway. It also will make, but I like to book it out with the job sheet just because as working in a branch, it keeps me on track for the month rather than having a big internal go out at the end of the month that I maybe not be expecting. You know, I thought, yeah. oh, for yeah. I forgot we damaged all these parts. Now I've got £500 coming off my last day. Yeah. Now I like to keep it on the job sheet because then it kind of that keeps me on track throughout day. the month. So, um, so you, also it can affect then like your item margin it doesn't give you a true reflection of your item margin for the month because it'll make it look bad based on damaged parts so you might if you put it on your internal you could monitor your item margin a lot better throughout the month and then once you've wrote your stock off at the end yeah that is just a stock write-off yeah. but if you are trying to monitor your margin better booking it out on the job will bring that down so do yeah. you, emma do you when you put it on the the job and then would you 100 percent discount that on the yeah yes yeah, so that's the way i do it is i put it on the job, the job and not cap. only that mm -hmm. when you're looking at back at a customer's history you can they'll be like oh well this wheel bearing looks new oh no we never fitted that oh yes yeah. we did we actually damaged it and replaced it there's just no record of it going on that car yeah i see that now and, and do, do you show it on the customers invoice yeah so yeah so that means the customer will then get it on the invoice the customer knows what they've done you know i don't see them ever having a yeah. problem with it because the charge no. you know the never charge has never been crossed over they've got more for the money than anything else yeah um and that's like when you're looking at the vehicle history you can then see mm -hmm. you, you then know exactly what's going on that car rather than putting a damaged part on an internal at the end of the month yeah and like i don't know which way is the right way to do it i was just interested in people's opinions yeah. I think, I think right way is um, and wrong way. I think they in different scenarios, depending on what you want the outcome to be, they both could be um, both ways of processing it. I think it's what data you're going to be looking at, uh, more likely to be looking at, and therefore which way and you want uh, which way you want to process it. But um, yeah, it's, it's 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 a really good point. It's something I'd not considered uh, myself actually. So yeah, really good point. I, I have one more question if nobody else has. Well, are we um, waiting for anyone else, Kitty? Gavin, Gavin and Eleanor, I can see they wanted to ask something. Okay, okay so we'll come back to you at the end if you don't mind, mate. If, uh, yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, okay. Hi, yeah, you touched on um, sometimes you might get a delivery note and not an invoice. Yes. Um, and it does happen rarely. And at that point, I'm panicking because I know that job sheets will need to be posted. Uh -huh, and yeah. I'm not confident in posting the purchase order. Sure. Until I've got yeah. the invoice. So, what do I do on, in that case? 
So when you're on the purchase order, you won't be able to put an invoice number in because you won't have one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll still need to produce an item number. Hopefully the delivery note has an item number on, but don't forget there's nothing wrong with you making your own part number. You can sell an item once you've purchased it on whatever item number you like. Mm -hmm. um, and you can bring it into stock even without a cost price if you don't have one. But ideally, mm -hmm. again, if that's on the delivery note, you put your cost price in. Now, when you go to post, so you won't have the uh, vendor uh, authorization uh, the, the vendor invoice number in there, you go to post like you normally would, and rather than hitting um, receive, post and receive, re, you know, receive the invoice and uh, and post, you, you're just going to, uh, you're just going to receive. So it okay. receives the item in. Now at that point, the purchase order will not disappear like it normally okay. does, because there is still an action and that action is to invoice that purchase order. Yeah. Uh, and at which point you can go back to the purchase order once you receive your yes, invoice, put your invoice number in and hit posting post and invoice. OK, that's great. Thank you. OK. Yeah. Um, so then we have the question, two questions from Amy um, because she can't unmute herself. I'm not sure <laughs> some technical issues. But so the first question is, if you put a tool on GL account rather than item, then would you still post it uh, in an internal job sheet or not need to? No, so um, for those who aren't aware, you do have the option. Um, most of the time when you're booking stuff in, you're creating an item. Um, and a lot of people, if booking something like a tool in, would put it straight to their accounting system. But you may have noticed you have the option for general ledger as well as item. Uh, and at that point, you get a list of your nominals to choose from. Uh, where the item number usually goes and you might put a quantity of one a description an amount now what this does is it processes the purchase without creating an item which is how uh, you would process something like that through garage hive uh, now because there is no item there is no item to process through the internal job sheet so no you would not need to process the item because there wouldn't be one OK, um, Amy, you can comment in the chat if you if it answered that question. And the second question from her is, can I post a job sheet if items marked as received but not invoiced yet? Absolutely, yeah. So just following on from the, the question we had around how we do that uh, and how we physically process that. Once received, um, that will increase your inventory as it normally would if you received an invoiced. Um, and you'll be able to invoice that as normal. That's the that's the idea behind being able to split that is to give you that flexibility to be able to book a part in and sell it out prior to having that invoice. OK, I hope that clarifies and Barry, you can go next. <laughs> Hi there, um, this, Tom, you might want to come back to me about this as well. Um, we've noticed stuff like oil and engine flushes uh, that we, we use here. The oil, now we get that you might use a 0.1 less and 0.2 less over a, a job and then over over a, a few weeks of that might add up to one litre of oil yep. difference yep. in your stock, so that, that's fine. But just a few weeks ago, we noticed that there was like 25 litres down and one specific oil from what we had in stock. Um, and like the engine flushes, there was a full case difference. Uh, and we, we kept, we're tracking it really. Um, we're keeping a, a, a quite a tight eye on it now to the point where, to, just as we've been having this, uh, we're saying we'll, we're stock checking at the end of the day and then checking it the following day to see if there's a difference in, in the stock level as to what has been charged out. And we're wondering if there's a wee, if there is a a flaw in the system somewhere that that is miscalculating our stock. I mean, would I ever say there is never, ever, ever going to be an issue that? Um, no, of course I wouldn't. But I I think it highly unlikely right. um, that that would be the case. Now, um, I think this is a good old a bit of investigation of where this has come from you know computers computer system bit of software is very black and white isn't it you know yeah. you put you put this on it puts 10 on you sell 10 it takes 10 off so yeah. i think there will be there will be an answer somewhere 
hopefully this is an administration error at some point. Um, I, you know, I'm not saying it definitely is, but absolutely what we need to do is need to look at that history, look at the invoices we've got and feather out where the discrepancy has come from. We yeah. will be able to narrow it down to when it happened. Yeah. And then from there, combined with, you know, maybe the uh, the odd invoice that might have gone amiss or not been sent or what have it just, you. It just seems to be with the fluids that we're noticing it. Um, and like I, like I say, I get the, the point, maybe point 0.1 more oil put in a car and, and, yeah, and that yeah. adds up, right, that fair enough. But for it to be kind of 20, 25 litres. Yeah, there's got to be something is, there, isn't there? Yeah. So, so to, to catch everyone up, what, what Barry's saying there is, you know, you, you inevitably are going to have to maintain and adjust oil levels um, a little bit because it's very difficult to be dead on accurate on how much you've used. Now, I would rather slightly overestimate a job and uh, be at a point where I physically have oil, but the system thinks I haven't. At least I can do a bit of a journal at that point as a gain and process that job. That doesn't inconvenience the customer. Rather that rather that than be conservative with the amount of oil I'm putting onto people's jobs, worrying about the cost and end up in a situation where I physically run out of oil while the system still thinks I've got mm. some. But no, in this I case, but, 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 in this, but in this case, I think that you're absolutely right, mate. There is something amiss and I am more than happy to get on the dog and bounty this afternoon and see if yeah, we can Just uh, uh, what brought it to light was there was a waiting customer and um, when James or Liam went to get the oil, it was, it showed something like 20 litres in stock, but there was only two on the shelf or, or, or two in the barrel or whatever. So I think that was what brought it to light. That's and then, what highlighted it. Yeah, we've been, we've, we looked at all the oil and there was some that were, were 20 litres different and stuff like that. So I don't know what's is there a Is there a time that's better for you this afternoon, mate, for me to call? <laughs> Laura's just helped me not today, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, what? Well, I'll be next in the office next Thursday. So right. it's with we'll, myself. We'll, with we'll myself we'll with this, yeah. So um, I'll drop you a message on WhatsApp. I've got your number, mate. We'll get a time to And I'll give me a chance to track it daily yeah. over the next week. See, or so. see what you can find out. Yeah. But there, there will, I'm confident there will be an answer uh, and we will be able to put it straight. And um, uh, I would hope there is some sort of administrative error and not an error on the system. I never say never, but I'm, I'm confident we'll be able to find it somewhere. Okay. We've had, a thing, we've had a similar thing with tyres where we we were showing something like six tyres in stock and they went to go and fit two and we only had one left. And okay. we yeah. actually found that the garage hive system, we'd put two on a job sheet yeah. and then when you bought it through, it changed it to one. And um, that is actually something that still continues to happen, but we now know that and we have to manually change so that, it. that's something you can recreate is it jackie sorry is that, is that something that so that's something you can consistently recreate yes yeah. that yeah. scenario um, yeah. please please uh, let's talk about this because that does sound uh, yeah. incorrect and like it shouldn't happen. Tires, i'm not saying it's definitely happened with your fluids but yeah. it definitely it definitely happened with our tires and i had to go back and look at yeah. our own vehicles so um we've got a fleet of vehicles that we maintain for our sister company and luckily it was for those so i could literally just raise an invoice and say there you go you've had actually had all of those and it wasn't an external customer i had, I had two tires fitted and Not only one okay that's um, definitely something i want to look into with you because um like I say, um, not saying that anything's ever perfect, but that certainly shouldn't be happening. Uh, yeah. That certainly shouldn't be happening. So um, I've got a note here, Jackie, to give you a call this afternoon. Um, are you available this afternoon? Um, yeah, uh, it's actually Richard, probably the best one to call. Richard, to OK, I'll speak to Richard about <laughs> it. OK, uh, we will absolutely get to the bottom of that one for you. Um, I've made a note and we will uh, look into that with you. Okay, I do have one other question as well. Yeah, go for it, yeah. And just very quickly, going back to this, um, where you can either receive the part, um, receive an invoice or whatever, what does that do on the account side? So um, she asked a really good question where she said, okay, I want to receive 
the part, but I haven't got the invoice yet, but that means it releases a job sheet and I can post a job sheet and invoice someone. What yes. happens to that cost of that part in the accounts? Has it gone to the accounts before you've got the invoice or not? Um, no, it won't have done because we haven't posted that uh, that invoice yet. Okay, so, um, do want, then, so then that worries me in that how do I find out um, if I told Richard about this, which I'm not sure I will, um, because at the moment he won't post anything unless he's got an invoice for it. So if I suddenly let him post without having had an invoice, how do I find out? Find out. You're worrying about balancing the books if it's uh, one, yeah. yeah, if it crosses that, if it crosses that crossover point. Um, doesn't come in, or he forgets about it. Where do yeah. they sit? Uh, again, again, um, with internal accountancy and that scenario, uh, not something I would like to um, give an answer with without checking a few things. Um, mm -hmm. It's certainly not something that I've uh, done too often, but it's a really good call because, like you say, it you know that cost if you're going over a, mm -hmm. uh, a particular period would need to, need to be accounted for. Um, so, um, again, uh, Tom, drop me to. I, I am here. Absolutely, Alex. So. If you're here, yeah, please do. <clears throat> so, Jackie, it will take an assumed average cost, right? Um, and then when you actually post the actual invoice, it will do an adjustment, right? Okay. So it does go through the accounts, it perfectly balances. But if you want to go into more detail, I'll show you the value entries and how it affects the value entries. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's fine. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Right, Brill. Has anyone else got any? Uh, we've got anyone else, Kitty, who's waiting? Doesn't look like anyone's waiting, so. Fab. Oh. oh. Dave? Yep. Yep. Okay. Just, just a quick one. Yeah, sure. Is it possible for a um, copy of your PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, of course. Um, do you want to, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll share that alongside the, uh, I'm sure when we post, is that right, Kitty? Yeah, yeah. So there is a recording of this session and also I'll post this on the community later when it's ready. Uh, the, the presentation as well. Presentation. Brilliant. Thank you very much. No problem. Right. Well, um, any questions, please give us a call. I'm in the office uh, today and I'll be available most of today. Um, and I'll probably look at you like that when you call. But uh, no, it's been a pleasure to have you all. Uh, thank you for listening to me and I hope um, that you've all taken something away from it. OK, thanks everyone. Thank nice you. one, Tom. Thank okay. you. Cheers now. Cheers. Bye -bye. Cheers.